Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Again, I'm Gabrielle Dara, and I will be the moderator. On behalf of the HBK team, I would like to welcome you to today's discussion focused on providing businesses with valuable information and resources to address the challenges created by the COVID-19 pandemic. We acknowledge that these are unprecedented circumstances, and we want to assure you that HBK is here for you and committed to helping you get through these difficult times. Our presentation is scheduled for 60 minutes. Attendees are, are set up in listen mode. Please submit any questions you may have in the control bar. We will address them at the end of the presentation. Our, present, our presenters include Amy Dallin and Ben DiGirolamo from our tax advisory group and Amy Renal from our manufacturer solution team. In today's discussion, we will be covering changes to federal and state tax laws, new and pending legislation triggered by COVID-19, and strategies to help businesses respond to such needs as managing cash flow and securing loans. This is an evolving situation and information is changing daily. We encourage you to visit our website, hbkcpa.com slash COVID for the latest news and resources. At this time, I'm going to turn over the presentation to Amy Dallin, who will be speaking about the recent federal and state tax changes. Good morning, everyone. I am going to be focusing on the federal tax filing and payment extensions, as well as some of the state extensions that we are seeing. Uh, and then later on in the presentation, I'm going to be coming, covering some of the individual topics of the current pending legislation that is sitting with the Senate, uh, or that has been passed, uh, passed by the Senate. So right now, where we stand with federal extensions, the IRS caused a bit of confusion when they originally announced Notice 2020-17, which only extended the tax payment deadline for certain payments. After that, they released Notice 2020-18. That extended the tax filing deadline for federal income tax returns to July 15th, and also included the extension for all payments to July 15th. So it basically superseded Notice 2020-17. So there are no longer any limitations on the payments that can be extended to July 15th. Now this notice applies to all persons, meaning individuals, trusts, estates, corporations, that have an income tax filing due date of April 15th. Note that this is just income tax. It does not include payroll taxes does not include information returns. And I'm gonna go through a list of some of the things that have not been extended in just a moment. With the federal income tax, it does include self-employment taxes. So those taxes that you're paying with your Form 1040, those are all included in that extension. It includes that first quarter 2020 estimated tax that is also due April 15th. But it does not include your second quarter estimated tax payment that is due June 15th. That is still due June 15th. Now, subsequent to releasing the notice 2020-18, the IRS released an FAQ page. We have the link to that at the very end of the presentation. But what they did with this frequently asked questions page is they confirmed a lot of things that uh, professionals were thinking were extended or were not extended. And they provided some very specific guidance there. One thing that they did do is they confirmed that the deadline for making contributions to IRAs, HSAs, and Archer MSAs has been extended. Now, those, uh, those contributions are typically uh, required to be made by the filing of the return. So we believe that that was extended anyway, but they did confirm that with the FAQ. They also confirmed that the extended due date for returns, if you file an extension by July 15th, will still be October 15th. They are not expanding that out to January 15th. So keep that in mind when you're filing the extension, July 15th, if you have to file an extension by July 15th, that that will only go to October 15th. We can go to the next slide. So what has not been extended? Again, second quarter estimates that are due June 15th have not been extended. Any information returns, Gift tax returns, those are Form 709. If anybody made any gifts, 
those returns have not been extended. So that you will either need to file an extension for the Form 1040, which covers the gift tax return, or you will have to file a separate extension for your gift tax return in order to file that timely, if you're not able to file that by April 15th. Estate tax returns have not been extended. Uh, one thing that has caused some confusion here, split interest trust returns. While a regular trust return form 1041 has been extended because that is an income tax return, this form 5227 is an information return and it has not been extended. Employee benefit returns, form, like Form 5500, those have not been extended. And the nonprofit returns that are due May 15th, those have not been extended. Some other notes based on questions that we have been receiving. The Form 11114, uh, the FBAR, the Foreign Bank Account Report, that is still due April 15th, that has not been extended. However, there is an automatic extension in place to October 15th, there is no filing required. So for all intents and purposes, you have until October 15th to file the FBAR. And the IRS did confirm that the three year statute of limitations to amend prior year returns has not been extended. So if you have a return that is coming up against that statute of limitations for April 15th, that return still needs to be amended by April 15th. Going into state income tax extensions, a lot of states follow federal, but a lot of states, even if they follow federal, they're either enacting their own legislation or they're coming out with notices just confirming that there are extensions in place. Now, a lot of times they are extending to the same due date, July 15th, but there are some outliers out there. The AICBA has a really good breakdown of all of the state uh, information for extensions, and we have a link to that on our website. So you can go to our website and you can find that there. Uh, some local tax filing deadlines have also been extended. So to the extent that there are separate local tax filings required, a lot of localities are coming out and, make, and providing for extensions. Again, that is on a case-by-case uh, -case basis, but there's a lot of information out there related to that and a lot of uh, announcements that are being put out there. So for specific states, the states that we typically focus on, in Florida, Governor DeSantis did announce that the Florida Department of Revenue is going to be flexible for the deadline for corporate income taxes, but there, as of right now, there is no specific extension for that. So the Florida has also come out with guidance on sales and use tax as well as real property taxes that some of that has been extended. I believe the real property tax has been a 15 day extension. Um, sales taxes you have till the end of each month in order to file for March and April. Uh, so they are releasing guidance uh, as they are making determinations. New Jersey, we are currently sitting with proposed legislation to extend that filing and payment deadline so that it would be consistent with the federal deadline, but they have not actually passed that uh, yet. For New York, Governor Cuomo did announce that they would be waiving interest and penalties for any late filed returns and payments, so long as they were paid and filed by July 15th. Um, and in New York City, Taxpayers can request a waiver of penalties on those late filed extensions or returns, um, or they could actually submit a separate request in order to request the uh, waiver of penalties. So what they are waiving, uh, if that request is made, is uh, penalties for the late filing, the late payment, and underpayment payment penalties. Uh, business and excise taxes for uh, those payments that are due between March 16th and April 25th, they are waiving those penalties, but interest is not waived. In Ohio, there is currently legislation that is pending that would specifically extend the filing and payment deadline to July 15th. Obviously, the intent is to extend that deadline. They do typically follow federal, and they have indicated that they would mirror that federal guidance. And then in Pennsylvania, uh, there is an extension for personal income tax return filing and payment that is to July 15th, again, mirroring federal. What they have done as well is they have extended both the first and the second quarter estimate to July 15th. So you don't have to pay that second quarter estimate uh, payment in June, that goes to July 15th. 
they have not yet provided for an extension for partnerships, trust estates, or S corporations. Um, although C corporations, that's based on the individual filing, and so that has actually been extended to August 15th. Um, so keep that in mind. They're expected to uh, release an extension for those returns, but as yet they don't have anything in place right now. And then in Philadelphia, they have extended that business income and receipts tax and then it profits tax to July 15th, including the estimates. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ben DiGirolamo and he's gonna cover some of the legislation that has passed. Great, thanks so much, Amy, and, and good morning to everyone. And, and thank you again for joining us uh, today for this presentation. In the essence of time, I wanna get right into the materials. I'll be covering two topics, two main topics today. Uh, first, the, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or the FFCRA. Uh, this is the known as the House bill. This was a bill that originated in the House of Representatives and was passed into law uh, on March 18th last week. Uh, and then I'll be talking about the, the Senate bill or the CARES Act, which sits with the House and is expected to be passed today and then signed into law today as well. Uh, Amy and I will be talking about, uh, at a high level, some of the, the important aspects uh, of that act. Uh, we'll be talking about them at a high level because we anticipate a, a future webinar probably next week. You should look for that, uh, where we can get into these topics and the provisions of the CARES Act in a little bit more detail. But today, uh, we wanted to focus on uh, the FFCRA uh, and specifically the benefits and credits provisions that apply as part of the FFCRA. So there's there's a lot else that was uh, included in the FFCRA funding for health and wellness programs uh, and funding of, of state unemployment. Um, those issues we're not gonna talk about. We're gonna specifically focus on the benefits and tax credits associated with those benefits that apply to employers and employees. Um, now, I noted at the, the beginning here in the first part of the slide that this may be modified or expanded by pending legislation. Uh, there isn't anything specifically in the CARES Act that's going to change these provisions, but uh, everything is subject to change. So what the FFCRA did uh, was add two uh, provisions, a paid sick leave program and expanded uh, FMLA, family medical leave, uh, as a response to COVID-19. Both of these leave provisions are to take effect on April 1st, 2020. There was a little bit of a question as to when they would take effect because uh, the bill said that it, it was to take effect sometime within 15 days of passing, which was March 18th. We now know through Department of Labor, uh, through their website and their FAQ, which is uh, included in our resources page at the end of this presentation, that they expect these provisions to be in place for employers by April 1st, which I, I believe is next Wednesday. Uh, the, uh, the provisions, the benefit provisions and the associated credits with those provisions apply to all covered employers. Covered employers are, are generally defined as public and private employers with fewer than 500 employees. Uh, there is a, an exception for small businesses with less than 50 employees. They'll have to apply uh, if they want to qualify for that exemption, saying that, uh, that the, the use of this, uh, these provisions or paying these provisions would jeopardize the viability of their business as a going concern. Uh, I think what's important now is just to to assume that any business with less than 500 employees is going to be subject uh, to these two provisions. We, we don't have the specifics on how you would apply for an exception if you have less than 50 employees. Uh, that, that may be an opportunity for some, uh, but I think it's safe to assume for most businesses right now, if you have less than 500 employees, uh, you will be subject. So let's, let's look at those provisions on the next slide. Uh, paid sick leave has has two separate uh, buckets of, of benefits that are available to employees. Now this this applies to all employees. There's there's no waiting period. Uh, you're eligible for these benefits immediately. There's no time served or, or days uh, employed that is required to uh, qualify for these benefits. Uh, and they both take place. One important thing with the sick leave to note is that. Uh, they're, they're only available to an employee if they are unable to work uh, because of these two different situations. If they're able to work, they may not be working from their office or in their normal capacity, but they are able to work, uh, say, from home, then they will not be eligible for, uh, for the paid sick leave. So uh, the provision allows for two weeks, up to 80 hours of paid sick leave at the employee's regular rate if they are unable to work because they've been quarantined 
uh, pursuant to federal, state, or local government or at the advice of a healthcare provider, uh, or if they are experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 uh, and are seeking a medical diagnosis. So if somebody is, is out of work and unable to work for, uh, for one of those reasons and you are a covered employer, you'll have to pay them their regular rate of pay uh, for up to two weeks, up to 80 hours. Uh, and the alternative, if somebody is at home and unable to work uh, because they are caring for somebody who's been quarantined under those same provisions, a family member or someone else that they have to provide care to, or because a child uh, under the age of 18 whose school or, or child care was closed as a result of COVID-19, they would also uh, be available, be eligible to claim this initial two weeks or 80 hours of paid sick leave. Uh, the difference is that if it's for caring for somebody else who may be sick or, or because of their, their school was closed, their pay would be limited to two thirds of their normal pay. Next slide, please. That was the sick leave. That's the first portion uh, of the expanded benefits from the FFCRA. Uh, the second portion comes from this expanded family and medical leave, which uh, provides up to an additional 10 weeks uh, of paid benefits to, uh, to certain employees. Now, in this case, somebody, an employee who's eligible for these benefits has to have been employed uh, for, for at least 30 days with the employee. Anybody who's been hired in the prior 30 days would not be eligible for this expanded family and medical leave program. Uh, the fam expanded family and medical leave program allows for up to an additional 10 weeks uh, of pay if that person is unable to work because uh, their child is, is at home because their school or child care provider was closed. So this isn't tied to anyone being uh, sick uh, or being quarantined or being quarantined, but instead uh, it is tied to the fact that they have a child that they need to, to be home uh, and caring for because their school was closed uh, or their child care provider was closed. Um, again, this this is this is like the uh, this is like the the sick leave uh, and the prior slide in that it would only be available. You can leave this slide. Okay, it would only be available to cover up to two thirds of your regular uh, rate of pay. So one one of the questions that's that's come up a lot with both of these programs, uh, particularly the sick leave, is uh, do the state orders to stay home? The stay home order that we see in Ohio and in Pennsylvania, uh, I believe New York has one as well, and other states, does that count to qualify somebody for sick leave? Uh, I think there's still some question as to whether or not uh, that would qualify your employees uh, for those benefits. I think the conservative answer would be yes, that they would be qualified if they're subject to uh, a state program that mandates that they be uh, stay home, one, and two, as I said before, they have to be unable to work. So if they're home and working, they wouldn't be eligible. But let's look at the, the limits on those benefits. There's an additional limit on those benefits uh, on the next slide. So those employees who are out uh, on sick pay, the first two weeks of pay, uh, and, and they're dealing with, with their own illness or their own quarantine order, uh, and they're eligible for their full regular rate of pay, uh, that will be capped at $511 per day or $5,110 in the aggregate over that two week period. Um, one of the questions that's 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 been been asked or come in is, well, uh, is that person who would normally be be making overtime are they eligible for that overtime? Uh, I think the answer here is that for for those that while they're out on the sick leave, the initial two weeks of leave, uh, they would not be eligible for overtime because it's specifically capped at 80 hours. Uh, however, the the other leave, the the, the two thirds leave for expanded FMLA talks about their regular rate of pay. And in that case, I think we would have to, to consider uh, somebody who might be working regular overtime and coming up with the two thirds pay that they would be entitled to. So the two thirds pay uh, for somebody who's caring for somebody under the first two weeks of sick leave is capped at $200 per day or $2,000 in the aggregate over the two week period. And the leave for childcare, the expanded uh, family leave uh, that adds an additional 10 weeks to the sick leave for a total of 12 weeks uh, that is capped at uh, two thirds of the regular pay and also that same $200 per day uh, and $12,000 in the aggregate. Now the, 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 family, uh, the family leave, there is a, a two week delay. You can't claim that until after the first two weeks. In the first two weeks, that person would qualify uh, under the sick leave for caring for that person. So the first two weeks would be covered by the sick leave and the remaining 10 uh, for a total of a 12 week period would be covered by the expanded FMLA.
Now, here's, here's the good news associated with these programs for employers. Uh, the FFCRA calls for a 100% reimbursement uh, to the employers for the amounts they pay to their employees under this leave. That 100% of pay can cover uh, health insurance costs as well that the employer is paying for their employees. Uh, the employer side of, of payroll tax liability would be waived on these payments. Uh, and self-employed individuals uh, also have an opportunity to receive an equivalent cre credit if they're unable to work uh, as a result uh, of COVID-19. Uh, now, the IRS is, is, is trying to set this up so reimbursements will be quick uh, and easy to obtain. It will be a dollar for dollar tax offset against payroll taxes. So whatever you're paying those people and, and wages while they're out on either the sick leave or the family leave uh, will become uh, a credit, something that be, can, can be credited dollar for dollar against payroll tax uh, obligations whenever that employer is filing their payroll return. Uh, if there's a refund owed, meaning that uh, the amount that you're paying in, in wages is in excess of the withholding amount that you would be required to remit uh, with payroll, and then you would be due a refund. The IRS is uh, saying that they're going to send these refunds as quickly as possible. Uh, their website right now says that next week they, they plan to have that process in place and published as to how you would apply for that refund. Um, but they're, they're saying that they're, they're trying to do this as quick as possible so that cash uh, if there's an actual cash outlay to pay those employees that the employers uh, would be able to receive those funds as quickly as possible. So I have a couple examples on the next slide uh, of how this works. And, and those actually come uh, directly from, uh, these come directly from the uh, the IRS website uh, on these credits. And so the payroll, tax, the payroll taxes that are available for retention, and that means the things that you wouldn't have to remit because you're you're paying uh, employees uh, under either of these provisions and you're entitled to them credit actually include really everything that you would be entitled to remit uh, on that payroll tax return. Uh, not only uh, not only FICA or, or the employer share of FICA, uh, but also the employee's uh, federal income tax withholding, the employee share uh, of those benefits, uh, and the employer share as well. And, and this was kind of surprising to me when I first read that uh, on the IRS website that uh, those amounts that are really just being withheld on behalf uh, of the employee would be available to be credited against their pay. Uh, but uh, it, it, it does make sense because the aim is to allow the employee to, to offset the cost of those, uh, of those wages as soon as possible. So anything that they would be required to withhold and remit uh, to the IRS with the payroll tax returns is eligible for the credit. So a couple of examples that they uh, posted on their website, if an eligible employer paid $5,000 in sick leave, and was otherwise required to deposit $8,000 with their payroll taxes, uh, they would be able to be they would, be, they would have a credit of $5,000 against uh, that $8,000 required deposit, uh, and would only have to deposit the remaining $3,000. The next example says that if we have an employer who paid $10,000 in sick leave and had that same $8,000 deposit requirement, they would be able to uh, not only not pay that $8,000 but to uh, submit a request for refund, uh, which hopefully will be uh, timely processed and returned to them with $2,000. Uh, the final point there is that there is a, a, an equivalent for the child care and sick leave that's available to uh, self-employed individuals as well uh, to reduce their self-employment obligations. So uh, I think that's the last slide I have on the FFCRA. Yeah, and with the, the last uh, few minutes here, I, I wanted to highlight some of the provisions. Again, this is the Senate Act. This is the bill that uh, was, was passed and signed into law, or excuse me, not signed into law or passed, but passed by the Senate on Wednesday, expected to be uh, passed by the House and signed into law uh, today and provides a, a number of other provisions, tax provisions and financial provisions for businesses uh, that we intend to dive into in more detail uh, probably next week with the webinar, but just kind of hitting on some of the highlights here. Uh, the employee and retention tax credit. This is going to be a refundable uh, tax credit against payroll uh, for up to 50% uh, of wages paid uh, to employees during an eligible time frame. Uh, this is this is this will be available for businesses that are either partially or fully uh, suspended or shut down as a result of COVID, uh, or businesses whose gross receipts decline more than 50% when compared to the same quarter of last year. Uh, if you fall into those categories, you'll be and you're paying, you continue to pay your employees, you'll be eligible for a 50% credit up to $10,000 per employee uh, for amounts that you pay to your employees during that time. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, all employers will be eligible to, to delay their portion of payroll taxes uh, from uh, the enactment of this law uh, when this law gets signed into, into law, which we expect to be today, uh, through the end uh, of the year, through the end of, uh, uh, of 2020, any payroll taxes that would be due the employer side uh, are not going to be required to be paid. Uh, instead, 50% of that amount would be due uh, on December 31st of 2021, and the remaining half would be due uh, December 31st, 2020. So essentially, they're giving you two years to pay the employer side uh, of FICA taxes uh, for wages paid between the enactment of this law and the end of the year. Uh, next slide, please. This slide in includes uh, kind of a litany of, of, of tax changes to the tax provisions here, an increase in NOLs, uh, a modification of loss limitations for uh, flow through entities, uh, repeal of the corporate AMT uh, that occurred last year would be immediately refundable uh, to those C corporations, an increase in the business interest uh, expense limitation, uh, a technical correction that allows some immediate write-offs, a temporary exception from an alcohol excise tax, uh, and an increase in the corporate charitable contribution limitation. Again, I apologize for going through these things so quickly. Uh, we, we do have some more information on these things published on our website, uh, and we'll be publishing more as we go on. Uh, I have one additional slide, which is probably the biggest uh, part of the uh, CARES Act that, that we'll be uh, publishing on and, and, and speaking about at our future webinar. And this is the Paycheck Protection Program, which allows for uh, all, all businesses with less than 500 employees uh, to uh, apply for a loan, uh, an SBA loan, uh, which will be eligible for a loan forgiveness. That loan can cover uh, payroll, uh, rent, mortgage payments and utilities uh, for a certain period of time. Uh, and to the extent that those uh, that those amounts are, are spent on those expenses uh, and to the extent that, and subject to a limitation that it'll be uh, whether or not you've, you've retained your employee headcount uh, for the same period from the prior year and retained uh, a level of compensation for those employees that hasn't dipped by more than 25%, those, uh, those borrowers will be able, will be entitled to, to claim or to, to request to have those amounts forgiven completely. So they wouldn't be uh, they wouldn't be required to repay that loan. Uh, probably the biggest provision of the Senate uh, CARES Act. Uh, look for more uh, from us on that uh, very soon. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Amy to talk about some of the individual provisions of the CARES Act. Thanks, Ben. So the big thing that everybody's talking about in the news is these individual rebates. And what they really are is they're an advance credit payment. Uh, the limits that they put up, it's 1200 per adult, 2400 per married couples, and then an additional 500 per child. Now, they have income limitations, the 75000 for single filers, 150000 for married filing jointly. That phases out uh, so that when you get to single filers with 99000 or married filing jointly with 198000 AGI, there, people that have AGI over that, your adjusted gross income over that, you're not going to get a payment. Now that phase out amount does increase if a couple has a child or a single person has a child. Uh, and so that does go up uh, proportionately with the child. They are expecting to start these payments by April 6th. That does not necessarily mean that everybody is going to get paid by April 6th. They're going to be doing it via direct deposit uh, and then mailing checks as necessary. They hope to have everything paid out by the end of the year, December 31st of 2020. So anytime in that frame time, they will send out these amounts. The amounts are going to be based on the 2019 returns, or if they haven't been filed yet, they'll look at 2018. If they have not filed 2018 or 2019, then they'll start looking at the social security statement. But when someone files finally their 2020 income tax return, that's when the actual credit gets calculated. So if a person receives this payment and it turns out that their income went up on the 2020 income tax return. It does not look like that that a payment amount that was received has to be repaid. There's no provision in there that is requiring that repayment. However, if they have higher income in 2018 or 2019, but the 2020 return looks like they would be entitled to all or a portion of the credit uh, or a higher credit amount, then they'll get that at that time of filing with the 2020 return. Next slide. For retirement plan withdrawals, uh, this is a typical provision that you see with qualified disasters. Uh, taxpayers will be able to withdraw up to $100,000 penalty-free 
uh, and then recognize that income over three years to the extent that they need it for this COVID-19 uh, virus pandemic. Uh, it would also allow those taxpayers to recontribute those funds to the qualified plan or a qualified plan during that three-year period, and they would not apply those contribution limitations. So essentially, if you take that $100,000 out, you can repay that during that three-year period and uh, you'll be fine. Uh, it also provides additional flexibility for loans that relate to coronavirus. I believe they increased the loan amount from 50,000 to 100,000, um, so long as it is paid out during that 180 day period after the enactment of this law. And uh, another provision there would also waive the 2020 required minimum distribution. So no required minimum distribution for 2020, as long as this is, it passes the house today and uh, gets signed by President Trump. Next slide. Briefly, student loans. Uh, employers are able to contribute up to 5250 annually up through January 1st, 2021 to an employee student loan. They basically expanded the current law that allows employers to pay for qualified educational expenses. So they've just expanded this to cover student loans as well. Uh, and then they would also suspend federal student loan payments until September 30th, 2020 for charitable contributions. They have created this new above the line deduction of $300, but this is only for taxpayers that do not itemize their deductions. So if you itemize your deductions, you still take your normal charitable contribution deduction on Schedule A. It would also suspend the individual adjusted gross income limitations for charitable contributions that are made in 2020. Now, a lot of these provisions are trying to expand uh, relief essentially uh, for those charities. They're trying to promote charitable giving because the 2017 tax act that was passed, it essentially increased the standard deduction. So a lot of people were no longer getting a benefit from charitable contributions and charities were starting to suffer from that. So this is the first step in them trying to address some of that. And from what I've read, it sounds like they might be introducing additional legislation that would help to expand some of this. They might increase that amount that, uh, is required as an above the line deduction, um, but they're trying to find ways that they will able, be able to benefit charities. Uh, and one thing I did want to mention, Ben mentioned those loans uh, for small businesses and the, the loan forgiveness. Charities can apply for those loans as well, um, and that could help for payroll, mortgage payments, rent, utilities. Um, and then it's really designed so that those loans would then become grants to the charities. Uh, if so long as they use those funds for qualified purposes. Um, so that, that is an intent there with the, that loan provision. So that's all I have. Uh, so I am now going to pass this over to Amy Renault, and she is going to go through some of the business provisions here. Thank you so much, Amy. At this point in the presentation, we're going to pivot a little bit, uh, pivot from our focus on tax and legislation to talk about some of the actions managers should be taking to help your businesses through the COVID-19 crisis. So stepping back for a moment, as a business executive, there is no doubt that this time is really stressful for you. On one hand, we know that there's some businesses who may be temporarily closed due to the government orders. But on the other, we know that there's businesses out there, specifically those that are assisting in crisis relief efforts, that are overwhelmed and were unprepared for surges in demand. In any case, we're facing an unprecedented situation and there are many unknowns. There's going to be a great deal of uncertainty and we're all going to take some unpredictable turns to get us out to the other side. So what's going to help us do that? The first thing we're going to talk about is a checklist of a few action items you should be taking. So number one, communication. And this is critical with so many groups that you're interacting with. First, let's talk about employees. Talk with your employees about any of your internal business plans that will affect their employment. In some cases, this may be talks about the legislation that Amy and Ben just discussed. It could be unemployment. It could be how you're making your work environment safer and healthier during the continued operation. In any case, keep your lines of communication with your employees open. Be patient. Many of these employees may need information repeated over and over and over again. Just be patient with them. Admit to them when you don't have answers. Remember, employees are facing their own stresses during this time too. So it's really important that you keep those lines of communication with them as open as you possibly can. 
The next group we're going to talk about is customers. Talk with them about their plans and needs. Are there ways that you can better support them during the crisis? Perhaps doing things a little bit differently than you have traditionally. You might need to ramp up your abilities to supply them with products or services, but just keep that visibility there. The more visibility you can have about what your customers' needs are and what your revenue streams will be, the better you can plan financially. And as an extra bonus, communication and support can also create some long-term loyalty, which can pay off for you when we get to the other side of the crisis. The third group we're going to talk about is vendors, especially for those of you in manufacturing and distribution. You may need to cancel some purchase orders, but if you do this, make sure you know if those products or services are going to be available if you do cancel those orders and need the products or services at a later time. You might want to consider extending ship dates rather than canceling that purchase order. Again, communicate though. Talk with your vendors about what you should expect as far as supply interruptions and shortages. If there's weaknesses in your supply chain, it's not too late to act you may want to evaluate whether there's other alternatives that you should be considering as we get through the crisis. The last group we wanna talk about as far as communication is stakeholders and key advisors. This includes your board of directors, your lenders, your banks, your legal counsel, your insurance brokers, and your CPA firm. Keep us in the loop of what's happening in your business. The more we know about what's going on with you, the better that we can help you. You want to make sure that you have that support around you so that you can make really solid business decisions, at least the best that you can during this time of uncertainty. Next, for businesses that are continuing operations, make sure that you have that clean, safe, and healthy work environment that allows for social distancing. I'm sure most of you have already seen or heard the guidelines repeated a number of times, so we're not going to get those into those in depth. But we did want to mention this as something that managers should be acting on, as it's very important to keep your staff as healthy and safe as you can. If you have any questions about these guidelines, feel free to reach out to us after the webinar. The third item on the checklist is planning for potential staff absences. We don't want people in our workplace who are sick or who believe that they may be sick. Similarly, we know that in some cases, people may need to care for their loved ones. So as a result, you may likely see an increase in absences and those absences are likely going to extend for longer periods of time than what you're used to. Make sure you have a backup plan. How are you going to keep your business running if a key employee is unavailable? You might need to document critical processes. You might want to ensure that cross-training, of course, with social distancing in mind, is done so that you have a backup for those roles as well. Just make sure you have a backup plan in place if a key employee is unavailable for a few days or even a few weeks or longer. The fourth item on the checklist is understanding the resources available to you. We talked some about making sure that the companies, your advisors, your lenders, your, your lawyers, your CPA firm are, are involved, you know, know what's happening, can be good resources to you. There's also a lot of information circulating. I'm sure many of you have been bombarded with emails, webinars, social media, all of these different items telling you about news and resources. But check out government agencies that may be able to provide you with some support. Um, as Gabriella and I believe Amy mentioned as well, our website has a number of resources available to you, some that even direct you to those government sites. So make sure you check out what may be available to you and follow up as necessary. The last item on the list is knowing your challenges and roadblocks. Make sure that you have a team in place that can attack those realistically. You don't have to do it all yourself. Have that team create action plans so you have a clear plan and you know who's taking responsibility for what actions. Most importantly, understand that these plans are going to change. None of us have complete information right now, and we know this situation is very fluid. So we need to make sure that as the circumstances change, our plans are adapting too. One of the challenges or roadblocks that you may potentially face is managing cash. So go ahead to that next slide. We're going to talk about this challenge in particular. 
first, in line with the advice to communicate, communicate with your vendors, negotiate with them. If you can't pay your bills or you're going to pay late, talk to your vendors. Negotiate win-win solutions. Perhaps that may mean paying a portion of a bill or paying in installments rather than in a lump sum. Next, again, communicate with your customers. You may want to use some creativity, perhaps offering temporary discounts for quick payment. You may even consider offering a smaller discount to customers who pay within terms so that you're encouraging them to keep that cash coming into your business. Check your age receivables regularly. Follow up on overdue payments. You don't want a payment to be delayed for unnecessary reasons. The next item is reducing expenses, and we know this is tough for any business. However, times of growth, as many of us have just recently experienced, can hide inefficiencies, including in our purchasing actions. So determine if there are any cuts that can be made. Consider price shopping. If you find that you're paying too much for a product, go back to your current vendor and see if you can negotiate. Don't hastily switch vendors to save money in the short term, as this can cost you in the long term, especially if there's quality or delivery problems. Talk with insurance brokers. Talk with service providers. Perhaps some of your services are based on headcount or revenue. So if those items have changed, you may be able to rene renegotiate your fee. You may also consider freezing certain expenses or adding additional oversight to assure purchases align with your goals. And of course, reducing headcount may be something that we all face as well. Obviously, one of the toughest decisions, but it may be something you want to consider. Next, look for deferral options. Um, in the state of Ohio, the state's ordering that the Bureau of Workers Comp allow some payment deferrals. So we may see some similar efforts in other states. You might also want to consider deferring a portion of salaries, especially if you have high earning employees, with those deferrals to be paid at a later date. You can consider selling unneeded, unused assets, perhaps to your vendors or to your competitors who may have a, a use for those goods. Check on your line of credit. You may consider drawing on additional funds to ensure that you have working capital availability. And next, we again stress networking. Stay in touch, of course, from a distance. But obviously, your network is very powerful. Share your ideas. Share what has and hasn't worked for your business. Share your questions. Uh, make sure you use that network to its full advantage. And the last strategy that we want to talk about is, of course, planning your cash. And this may be the most important suggestion on this slide. Develop a cash forecast. Some of you may have done this um, for a lender, such as a 13-week cash forecast. These tools are, are invaluable, especially at times like this. They give you visibility to challenges that are upcoming. Make sure you plan for at least a few months. If you can plan longer, do it. Keep the forecast updated at least once per week. You should look at it and update it. If you're experienced, inexperienced in this, this is something that we can help with. Um, it's, again, just a great tool to show that visibility or to have that visibility and make sure you understand the roadblocks that may be ahead. Next slide. The last item that we want to talk about is some loan availability, um, and that's the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loans, which you may see referred to as EIDLs. These are $2 million maximum term loans. Um, there are not lines of credit available. You may be familiar with this program, the EIDL program, you know, due to other disasters, tornadoes, hurricanes, things like that that have happened in the past. But please know that this particular program is specific to coronavirus. So some terms may be a little different than what you have seen for a past disaster loan. The purpose is to support working capital, um, so you can use it for things like uh, bills that you need to pay, payroll, items like that. You cannot use it for investments such as property or equipment. Um, the interest rate is 3.75% for small businesses and 2.75% for nonprofits. The max uh, alloc amortization period is 30 years, and that term will be decided as well as the amount that you are awarded by the SBA based on your economic injury and some other factors that they will consider. 
They are offering a deferral for first year principal, although interest will still accrue during that time. But on the other side of that, if you are able to pay early, there is no early payment penalty. To apply, go to sba.gov backslash disaster. Um, we know that there's a great deal of traffic on the SBA website, so it may load slowly or even crash periodically. Uh, stay patient. Uh, ultimately, they just changed the application process yesterday, so you actually download the forms, complete them, and upload them back to the SBA. Um, you are no longer actually filling out the application or Form 5 directly on the website. There are no fees to apply as well. We know that all companies will need to submit the SBA application Form 5 and Form IRS 4506T, which is basically just allowing the tax returns to be released. The SBA will get back in touch with a, a bunch of other information that they're going to request from you. Um, a few of those are listed here. Just make sure that you have your financial information available and ready to submit as quickly as possible. Um, we're sure that their, their time to submit funds will lengthen as time goes on and they have more applicants. Um, last thing to note on this is that there are additional loan resources at the state level as well. Um, so make sure to check out your state resources page or the HBK website, um, and there will be additional information about state loans as well. Next slide. The last item that we just wanted to go through quickly was some key resources that may help each of you. Um, we've mentioned throughout our presentation the HBK website, and the link is listed there at the top. In addition, there's some IRS information, state extensions in relation to um, not only tax deadlines, but other programs as well. Um, Department of Labor resources uh, to go uh, with the information that Ben uh, provided us earlier in this presentation. And then again, lastly, that SBA loan uh, disaster page where you can go to apply for those EIDLs or, of course, obtain other information about that program. Gabby, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Amy. Lots of information shared today. Hopefully you found this very valuable. Um, we have been getting a lot of questions throughout the presentation, and so at this point, we are going to take some time to address those questions. Um, the first set of questions are specific to the FFCRA, and this one goes out to you, uh, Ben. Does this new act apply to charities and nonprofit organizations? It does, yeah. This does apply to nonprofit organizations. Uh, I think the, the the confusion there might be when it says private organizations. Uh, there's there's some exception for government agencies, but uh, nonprofits will be subject uh, to the FFCRA. Great. What are the implications um, for my employees if they apply for unemployment? If we receive funds from the SBA loan program and use those funds properly within it eight weeks, will the loan be forgiven? And what exactly does that yeah. mean? So, so I, I think that this is get, kind of getting into the uh, to the loans that are going to be available, the payroll protection loans that are going to be available under the CARES Act, uh, which, which, as I mentioned, is something that we, we intend to, to cover in more detail at, at a future date. Now, that said, I, I think uh, a couple things were asked there. If somebody's on unemployment, I, I assume that means that they've been, they've been laid off or had a reduction in their hours. Uh, and, and in which case, then uh, they're, they may be subject to a limitation uh, on on uh, on any loan or loan forgiveness because they they're either not paying that person, they've either reduced that person completely, or they've reduced their their pay by more than 25%. And so, uh, to the extent that somebody's been laid off uh, or had a sub substantial reduction in their pay, uh, they're likely not going to be eligible for for any benefits or loan forgiveness through through one of those loan programs. Now that said. Uh, that loan does uh, include a provision that allows you to rehire somebody within 30 days, uh, within 30 days, I think, of passing of the law, and, and still have them count towards those limitations, the headcount limitations, the compensation limitations. Right. The um, FFCRA had a specific provision that was related to the definition of covered employers. For those employers with 100 employees, but across multiple locations, would the small business less than 50 apply? 
So in yeah, aggregate, I, I, I didn't aggregate, see there any. Are... Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Common ownership, uh, as I understand it, is included. Uh, these definitions come to us from the Fair Labor Act, which uh, I, I can't uh, I can't claim to be an expert in. But but my understanding, my general understanding, both for the 50 or for the 50 employee uh, and the 500 employee, is that that common ownership is generally going to be lumped together. Uh, and it also, I should add or remind that if, if you if you're going for the the exception, the 50 employee or less exception, that's something that that needs to be applied for I, I think and approved that uh, that it would be uh, a challenge to the going concern of your business if you were subject to these provisions and we don't have uh, the process or, or, or procedure for how that would look at this point so I, I think it's it's fair as I mentioned before for, for most or all to assume if they have less than uh, if they have less than 500 employees that they are going to be subject uh, to the FFCRA uh, again, the good news uh, associated with that is hopefully there is a 100% tax credit to offset the costs uh, associated with paying those employees uh, under either of the benefit provisions of the FFCRA. Right. And do these provisions apply to part-time employees as well as full-time employees? Yes, they do. Yeah, they, they absolutely apply to part-time employees uh, using uh, an, an average rate of pay. Okay. And what about um, organizations where their employees are covered under a collective bargaining agreement? Yeah, that, that's a good question um, and, and probably a good time for me also to point out uh, that that uh, we, we are not labor attorneys. Uh, we, we can kind of share with you what, what we know at this point. Um, but any any kind of, of of ultimate decisions as to whether or not uh, you have employees who who must be covered under these provisions, uh, and all, oftentimes the question that's that's being coupled with that uh, are, are decisions on whether or not somebody's uh, as an employer is considering layoffs or or how they're going to pay these employees. Uh, any of those types of of benefit or uh, hiring and firing decisions need to be vetted with your with your lawyer and preferably an, an employment attorney. Um, I know that there is a specific provision. I believe that it can still be uh, applied to to those under collective bargaining. Um, but uh, you know, if, if we get that that person's email, we we can we can uh, respond with that specific link. But I I'm uncertain at this point. One of our attendees is an essential business that must stay open, and the question is: If our employees decide to obey the stay-at-home order, are they eligible for either? Of these new um, legislation and provisions. Yeah, it, and it's it's a good question there. Uh, you know, if, if it's their decision to to stay home um, because they're obeying those orders, I, I think that uh, you know I mentioned earlier, there's there's the question of whether the stay at home order would count uh, for sick leave. Now we're just talking about the sick leave, which is the the, the first uh, the first two weeks. Uh, that would say that they or somebody they're caring for uh, has been ordered to stay in isolation. I, I think the conservative read is that that would that that would count um, if somebody's. Uh, if this is kind of adding a layer to that though that says that if they are in an essential if they're in an essential business and they're voluntarily staying home, I don't think that they would be. Uh, I don't think that they would fall within that sick leave. Now the second part of the you know the second benefit here the extended or expanded FMLA. Uh, that's not tied, you know, to, to their own personal uh, stay at home. That that would have to be that they're unable to work because they have to stay home to care for somebody under under 18. So that that question really would would only be, be pertinent for the first two weeks. Uh, and, and I I it's it's a debatable question that I think they should they should confirm with their employment attorney. I, I would think uh, if they're in an essential business, uh, then they wouldn't be subject specifically to the stay home order. Okay. We're going to switch to the CARE Act. Um, the first question is, with regard to the CARE Act, CARES Act, will startups have the ability to take advantage of this? So given that the payroll, they have payroll this year, but they did not have any payroll in the prior quarter to compare against. Yeah, I, I can try that one. Uh, I mean, those, those are things that I, I can tell you we're all still Still working through exactly how those uh, how those limitations. I assume we're talking about the payroll forgiveness loans, 
uh, and I believe that there's a, a the, the default calculation is uh, you look to your your equal period of, of, of employees and, and compensation for that same period in the prior year. Um, and this question would be if you don't have uh, a, a similar period to compare it to. Uh, I, I believe that there's a provision for that. I, I can't tell you how that works right now. I don't know if uh, Amy or Amy have seen that, but uh, I can tell you that that is something that we'll, we would address uh, in our future presentation uh, that more specifically deals with these loans. Okay. Again, related to the CARES uh, Act, how do you prove you meet the two criteria to receive the credit? Are we talking about the payroll have, yeah. credit again? Yes, the payroll tax credit. How do you prove that you meet the criteria to receive the credit? I would think based is there on I would say based on Ben's response before, a lot of a lot of the information that's related to the CARES Act, we're still digesting that. We're still trying to understand how a lot of that works. Um, so I at this point I would say let's let's hold off if there are specific questions to just send us an email about them. We'll try to answer them as, as quickly as we can and as thoroughly as we can and that we're going to provide more thorough information on the CARES Act next week uh, and hopefully do a follow-up webinar on that. And, and thank you, Amy. And I, and I would also add to that that our, our intention at this point, uh, just as we've been doing already with these emergency loans to the SBA, uh, is to be able to, to help you and, and, and all of our clients uh, through that that application process and the loan forgiveness. And so uh, those those are things we will be able to answer for you. Great. On the topic of SBA loan, they in the application process, they ask for the amount of lost income. Um, our client has indicated they don't understand what that amount is yet. How do they go about estimate? And then can they update that estimate later? So ultimately, what the SBA has advised is to provide the best estimate that you possibly can about your economic injury. So they will ask for backup when they get back in touch with you. Um, that may be proof that, you know, you lost customers, for instance, or that you, you know, have some kind of decline in revenue that's dropping to the bottom line. Um, they won't necessarily allow you to change your application, but there will be clarification as the process goes on and they request that additional uh, material from you. Great. And, and Amy, this question would be directed, I think, to you as well. Um, why would we apply for EIDL when the SBA care loan has a forgiveness feature? So ultimately, um, you know, the, the one difference between the CARES Act and the EIDL is that you, well, first, the EIDL is available now, so you can start that application process if you wish. And when you are awarded the money, you don't necessarily need to take it. If the SBA comes back and say, we're willing to give you X as an EIDL, and you say, I don't want any of it, there's no, there's no uh, pay, a penalty for you to, to give that answer. So ultimately, if you want to get something in the works, that, that is an option. Um, in regards to the payroll in specific, you cannot use the EIDL and the money from the CARES Act provision uh, for the same purposes. So it may be that the EIDL funds are still uh, able to be used for other working capital needs, such as paying some bills that won't be you know, allowed to be paid for through the money from the CARES Act. One last question um, related to the SBA loan. Can businesses with a line of credit apply for the SBA loan? Yes, they can. So ultimately, what you may be referring to is that there is um, a line in the application and some information that you're probably reading saying that you can't have accessibility to funding elsewhere. The SBA has since clarified to say, you can't have accessibility to the same type of program elsewhere. So ultimately, for most businesses who are facing economic injury, they can't go to their bank and get additional funds at a 3.75% interest rate. So in most cases, in what the SBA said, in almost all cases, 
even if you have existing funding from a bank or other lender, you will still be uh, eligible to get those EIDL funds as well. Right. Well, we are over our allotted time and there are still some questions, but what we plan to do is actually respond directly to those folks that have sent in their inquiries. Um, and we will make this presentation available for everyone to view. Um, this will be sent out via an email with a link to the recording. So we want to um, thank you all for participating. Um, and hopefully you did get a lot of great information. Um, but if you have specific questions, feel free to email Amy Ben or Amy directly. And their information is shared here. And as noted, this presentation will be sent out to all the attendees so that you can actually have a copy of this and can directly uh, respond to um, the presenters who have shared this great information today. Thank you again for participating. Um, we wish you all well um, during this time and uh, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any specific questions or needs. Have a great day and a great weekend.